Hello, hello. Hi. Good afternoon. I am uh, happy to uh, introduce Adi Sood, who's going to be speaking on IoT botnets, the crux of Internet of Things chaos. Please give a warm Torkhan welcome to Adi. Yeah. First of all, welcome everyone, and thanks for taking time to attend this talk. I think for the next 40 to 45 minutes, hopefully we're going to have a good topic in our hand to discuss, and let's get it started. So today we're going to talk about in the context of IoT botnets, and we're going to delve into you know, a couple of the botnets that we have analyzed earlier, techniques, tactics, exploitation mechanisms, and then we have a few videos down the lane try to give you a feel that what you're talking about is really happening. So a little background on mine, um, just try to get you to understand you know, what I belong, what I do as a part of my research. So I drafted a book called Extracted Cyber Attacks, got published in Chinese as well, but just, just like, you know, idealistic approach of you know how to go after analyze the cyber attacks and everything so i want to lay a little disclaimer and the idea behind this like all the research that we're going to talk uh, in this or we're going to present uh, during the course of this timeline is nothing relates to the unemployer and the reason for that is because this is a kind of work that is being done in your free time as a motivation to share intelligence with the security research community and stuff like that so don't want to get it associated with uh, the employers. So let's get into it. So this is a realistic picture of our e-world these, these days. So what that means is like, you know, more of the design devices are interconnected in nature. And we'll take a deep dive into later on as well. The idea behind is that, you know, data movement is happening at a rapid pace. The devices that have increased significantly exponential, data processing, storage movement is exponential these days. And the reason behind that is that with the revolution, call it a mobile revolution in the last couple of years, you know, more and more devices, you know, exist, and they are interconnected. By an internet, with different protocols, Bluetooth, and all that, there's an interconnectivity somewhere. That means that, you know, attack surface is getting enlarged, and that is the more important part where the adversaries or nefarious uh, actors are going after. And I want to lay a little bit this research uh, uh, layout here, which actually gives you a glimpse how it looks like. So a couple of years back, we we're talking about in 2000 and all that, you know, we just talk about like 0.5 billion of devices. Right now, within the last 10 or 20 years, we are talking about close to 50 billion, which is gonna be by 2020. So you can expect that how much or how much the number has increased tremendously, which means that these devices are interconnected so as the attack surface is increased. And for People like, you know, adversaries are sitting on the internet, believe in just spawning the systems and all that. It, it is a kind of launch pad that you want to go after, right? More devices, easy to form botnets, easy to go after the large section of the uh, people on the internet, and then perform, you know, sort of nefarious operations. But that actually is a picture. That's where we're going to draft, you know, when we try to talk about threat models and all that. We want to see that with the passage of time, what has been changed, what has been increased. And... Moving forward, forward um, so let's a little bit talk about Internet of Things, right? In a different terminology, sometimes we call it Internet of Things, some people call it IT plus OT, depending on the things, I think, but there is not enough clarity on that part. Like, it's just a generic uh, outline there, Internet of Things, everything is comprised into it because these things have interface that are connected on the Internet, and they are communicating between each other. But again, we live in this world and all of that, and just a um, few minutes later, we're gonna discuss about a taxonomy so that we can dissect it accordingly because we need to go after architecture, we need to go after either device type, or we need to go after exploitation scenarios. So let's get it started. So these are a couple of snapshots. I took it from the media outlets to give you the reality of the IoT space, right? Security is nothing, is not, new, but the question is, are we really doing it? That's the question that is in front of us. So you look at a couple of these news articles, they talk about different IoT botnets that came to exist. You know, this was a Mirai one, there was the first one, the major one. But then there is a Reaper IoT bot, you know, Jenks bot, and all that. What it interprets is threats are real. You know, attackers are really go going after these devices, right? Whether it's routers, or switches, whether it's a kind of, you know, audio video conferencing systems, all of those kind of, you know, any smart device, it's a refrigerator, you know, is like, you know, 
other systems that are connected on the internet that is a potential target for the uh, you know, attackers to go after. But the threats are real. So before moving further, I think it's really important to understand the taxonomy here. And why it is important, because the way malicious code is written, they have to come up after certain kind of stringencies, which mean that they want to drive a code which work on all sort of platforms. Because when they run or when they conduct broad-based attack, the challenge there is they really want to go after a scenario where they just you know, distribute the code, let it run, and there should not be any kind of constraints by going after different device types and all that. So looking into this type, you know, you can build like different kind of taxonomy. Either it can be uh, based on device type, uh, you can be having a code drafted based on architecture, or different characteristics and functionality, right? You know, you compromise certain set of devices, what you are going to use for those devices for network communication and sort of things like that. But what we have seen recently, like, apart most of the malware authors, they are really gonna go after architecture specific code rather than some sort of device type. Because what they're doing is like they want to really go after underlying embedded firmware, whether it's a Nix, x86 platform, or any kind of platform. And that makes them easier to draft a code and run it on a continuously period of time. If they go after standard device type, okay, this is only going to go after like standard kind of Cisco switches or like kind of Hawaii routers and all that. Those kind of attacks also persist. But when they, they nearly need to go after millions of devices, they have to make a code which is kind of not device uh, dependent like device type dependent, but more on, more on the uh, functionalities type or you know, architecture type. So let's just go through a little bit of the IoT, IoT botnet attack model. The very simple thing is that, okay, distribute the code. When I say about in the earlier taxonomy, we discussed about, you know, they're not going to have the device type, but most of like architecture type. So you can see that they have switches, they can be having a video cameras, stuff like that, or different set of routers. The caution is that distribute the code, get the system compromised, build a botnet, and then start launching the attacks they want to do. One of the easiest interpretation of the way IoT botnets are built is like, you know, the compromised devices are used for triggering chain attacks as well. What I mean by that is that, you know, once you have a set of 100 or 200 kind of compromised devices, they can launch an attack and try to build or formulate more bots into it because by launching telnet scans, stuff like that. And we're going to show it in a demo down the lane as well. But considering like this time, any threat modeling anyone who wants to do in the field of security, I think taxonomy is the most important part to go after because that actually gives you the idea how you're really going to dissect a one specific space uh, in the security. So we talk about IoT taxonomy. We have a little bit, you know, gone through the IoT botnet attack model and all that. Let's just take a quick look on to how compromised IoT devices are being used. Of course, building botnets, launching distributed denial of service attacks. We've been talking about you know, Bitcoin mining these days as well. They are used for mining as well. Uh, one of the interesting scenarios where they build a stealthy attack flow is to you transform your routers, transform your IT devices into a stealthy proxy, um, which means that, okay, they have socks. They can set up a reverse proxy. Once you go through it, you can get it done. Uh, and then there's, of course, mining cryptocurrency and several other kind of you know, nefarious operations that they love to perform because Devices don't belong to them. They have the power. They have everything up. They want to perform certain activities on the internet that result in financial gains or maybe for fun purposes. But that is the idea of you know how the taxonomy, IoT partner attack model, and how it looks like to be a compromised IoT devices. Now, before moving further, you know the way we have drafted uh, going after this talk is you know based on reverse engineering that we performed, you know, analyze the code samples and stuff like that. We have picked up the code samples where that particular technique is implemented, and we're just gonna discuss that technique looking at the code and some stuff like that. The idea behind this layout is because we wanna see, hey, we have analyzed the real set of code, the techniques that we're gonna discuss is really exist in the wild. So let's take a look at it. The first one is the, that, so we're going to connect the dots as well, what we discussed earlier. So in the IoT taxonomy, partner taxonomy, we talk about, okay, they want to go after or formulate a call code, which is basically architecture specific, which means that they have to do the cross-platform compilation. Without that, it's really hard, because you can have a code on x86, but it's not going to run, might be on the MIPS architecture. So they need some kind of, uh, you know, harness the power of, uh, you know, open source projects, you know, build it, and then do the cross uh, platform compilation. 
and a couple of the Mirai variants. We're going to talk about a little later as well. So you can look at this one, code snippets. What they are trying to do is like they are going to different architectures and stuff like that, and they are building the binaries using that, whether it's ARM, whether it's uh, x86, MIPS, Spark, PowerPC, or whatever it is, right? And then they have a separate code, how they're going to fetch the payloads and bins and all that. But cross-platform compilation, compilation is a very important uh, aspect for um, you know, malware authors these days. Let's take a look at further into different functionality we call as like you know, distributed denial of service functions. Of course, once you build the botnets, you really want to launch some set of attacks, right? Because if these are bot, formulating a botnet, of course, distributed denial of service attacks going to be there. And when we analyze, there can be multiple. The DDoS stack can be at a layer three or four, which is TCP, UDP, or IP layer. And then they can be at the TCP layer seven, which is the HTTP um, layer. So they can go after like you know sin flooding, different kind of set. But they have this built-in functionality, and this code actually tells that how they actually fork the process, and then they can have it in a chain reaction trigger, you know, give the guidance to the different bots there, and trigger the attack on a you know dedicated target. But this is there, you know, they they are actually going after this kind of functionality. DDoS is not nothing new, but the important part is that it still persists, uh, and that's why whatever the new bots net that are being formed. They still have this functionality. Taking a little deeper look into kind of different kind of denial of service attack variants, you know, there can be TCP attack, UDP, you know, that's a talk about either it can be at the layer three or four or can be at the layer seven of the TCP IP model. But it works pretty well, right? You know, basically attackers, they just simply compromise the system and they're just gonna go after because they can harness the power of that system and do whatever they wanna do on the internet. But this is, like, this is a kind of like a de facto standard in most of the botnets, whether it belongs to IoT or it belongs to any kind of different uh, sphere. Now let's go further and talk about bot kill. What I mean, what, what this technique is all about, you know, we always talk about, you know, fights going on and all that, but, you know, there are bot wars also exist in the space where different adversaries form different botnets, right? And they want to make sure that their control is much more than the other person. Which means that they have to draft a code in such a way, let's say they install it on a, one of the compromised system, they have to actually scan through the listed processes or some other artifacts on the system to make sure that this particular compromised device doesn't belong to any other botnet. If it does, just go ahead, trigger the commands, kill it, make it yours. Which means that these guys are performing wars as well, right? And this technique actually we is just doing, so they are actually scanning some of the, you know, uh, binary checks and all that, and then when they found that, okay, this compromised device doesn't belong to me, but I found an artifact that is from different botnet, kill those things, make, you know, either reboot or form other set of functionalities to control that um, compromised system and make it a part of their own botnet. So bot kill is a very important feature, uh, even like, you know, the way malicious code is designed in the underground community. Another interesting uh, technique they actually used to go after is the kill all functionality, right? Sometimes, okay, they are going after, you know, they are scanning the processes, looking into different indicators in the system, but then they found that there's no way to actually kill that infection. So what they can also do is like to just simply go ahead, kill the standard processes, reboot the system, and try to see if they can, you know, other, other bot that is sitting somewhere can rescan it, get it back into that system, and then make it a part of it. But again, this is a kind of very interesting technique as well. Just go ahead and kill everything up, get a complete control, and then from there onwards, just roll the infections in a different way. But that's the way it is being done. Uh, but these are the kind of standard functionalities that these bots and inherent malicious code has built in. Of course, moving forward, reverse shell, very much important, because some, sometimes what happens you know, we have a network parameter devices, uh, you know, lined up, you know, and there's ingress, egress filtering is going on. Ports might get closed and all that. So attackers or adversaries, they don't want to lose the control, right? So what they come up with a different technique, being, you know, this is also a technique that is being opted by different botnets as well. Um, it's like, just like implement a reverse shell, right? Either a SOX proxy or some other kind of thing. What that means is it actually helps them to bypass the scenario because the connection is initiated via reverse shell rather than a direct connection from inter, um, external to internal, which is, you know, with the firewalls and other network parameter devices is not um, possible. But 
this code actually states that you know some of the botnets, you know, basically IoT bot, they also come up with this kind of functionality, you know, and trigger a reverse shell so that the attackers still have a control over that, and whatever the updates they want to perform and things like that, just can go ahead and do it. Now, now we try to look into a little bit of different, you know, functionalities from the perspective of how the, uh, you know, when they are writing this malicious code and all that, you know, you, sometimes people there is no fun of reinventing the wheel, right? And that's why from this part of analogy, it comes up like, you know, adversaries, they actually draft a code and actually harness the power of open source packages as well. Maybe we have seen like they are directly picking that, you know, raw bar package directly from the GitHub, embed it, run the scripts, and perform the function functionality. So what we have seen earlier, or even at right now, a couple of these standard packages that are open source one uh, with the you know, smaller size, compressed ones are being used heavily. BZBox, uh, heavily used uh, because it's gonna give you the portable binary uh, you know, power where you can actually simply call BZBox and then you know, run different set of commands. Uh, but it's being heavily used, so BZBox package. Open source one, you, know, you get the compiled binary, call it, call the functions, trigger it in the firmware and then actually run different things. Another one interesting software package is a drop beer SSH, right? It's a very, you know, custom, very compact, you know, SSH client server uh, bindery, right? And again, the idea again in this part is that somewhere, some part of time, where they want to open an SSS port or some kind of those activity, basically they have to perform a remote administration at the end of the day. With that, they really need some kind of, you know, remote access protocol to be in place. Either it can be telnet or they really want to say that, hey, I need SSH access into that. So they really harness the power of this package as well. So we'll take a look in, down the lane in our video demonstration. But these things, these packages are really, really important from their point of view because just call them directly, enhance the functionality of the bot, and perform whatever the operations they want to in an unauthorized fashion. Another interesting scenario, so we're going to connect the dot back to the, our IoT botnet taxonomy where we talk about, okay, whenever they want to draft a code, they actually want to go after architecture-specific code for which they have to do the cross-platform uh, compilation, right? But how they can do it? Still, the answer is the open source packages that are available. Nonetheless, these packages are not bad. They are, you know, designed for some specific set of functionalities, but again, is the, you know, is the way that our cyber world works. Some of the good things can be abused in a different way to perform you know, unwanted operations. So with the ABBA original Linux and all that, the way it is being designed, you can still compile the binary in a cross-platform way, and then just call the binary, you know, call the functions, compile it, and then you have the binary available. You can run it, and run it on any architecture. It will pick up the artifacts from that system, and it won't stop, and it will install. That's way how the malicious code is being done. Because sometimes, the way botnets are performed, they might not gonna go after targeted attacks. Like when we talk about targeted attacks earlier, we're going after, you know, people going after specific organization or some kind of a different set of people, right? But when the broad-based attacks are there, you know, they wanna go after thousands of routers, you know, millions of IoT devices, they just wanna run it on the blind, right? Whatever comes in, forms the botnet, go after and do the, you know, unauthorized operations. But three packages, apart from standard Linux utilities like wget, curl, and all that, you know, these three packages, Dropbeer, SSH client, BZBox, and the IBA original Linux one, heavily used these days. Um, and if you even search, uh, you know, search the internet within the last week and all that, try to look into the news in the IoT space, all people are calling about that. And then further, right? Uh, of course, we know malicious code is written in such a way, you know, people want to have some kind of obfuscation on encryption in place, right? So if you perform reverse engineering, it's just a bit hard to, um, you know, dissect the code. Maybe it's just not in a kind of advanced level of the encryption that these malware authors deploy in the malicious code. But again, at the end of the way, there's some kind of things they still deploy with respect to obfuscation. So while we're analyzing the code and all that, uh, after pen testing certain servers where we are able to get that code, and you can clearly see that this code actually states like, okay, they are using the, you know, Zor obfuscation and all that. Might not be that advanced, but still, it served the purpose to some extent. But they definitely deploy data encryption and obfuscation strategies as well. 
Now, moving forward, it's like a device architecture detection. When we talk about, okay, we compile the code in a cross, sorry, cross-platform cross way, but before that, when this like App Original was there and they found out that, hey, we can use this package to do this kind of functionality, earlier they still have some kind of embedded code in place, which means that before the standard code, the malicious code, the payload actually going to run on the system, they're gonna wanna detect the architecture. Again, the idea is that they don't want to actually get detected and things like that. So, okay, if it's x86, pick up the x86, call that code, or use the wget to fetch only x86 code, download it, run it, and get it infected, and things like that. But um, of course, with the passage of time, you know, things are getting enhanced. More and more new techniques are coming up. But this was a part of policy uh, as well, the way they designed the malicious code earlier. Just try to give you a quick feel of it. Um, after analyzing a couple of this IoT bots and all that, you know, embedded strings. So these are a couple of standard uh, telnet embedded username and passwords. Uh, these guys love to go after, you know, telnet, telnet standard devices. They pick it from like a default passwords and all that. Build up the strings. It can be either embedded in the binder itself or it can be a separate file, which they call and then you know trigger the things. But again, at the end of the day, the important part in this context is that, you know, look at the way IoT bots are formed, the malicious binaries, so much into it, right? Different techniques. We talk about kill, bo kill bot. We talk about, you know, they have a device architecture detection code, you know, DDoS code, and things like that. Again, then it's because they have to do the scanning, they have to build uh, bigger botnets. So they actually have to go after other bots, basically other systems on the internet so that it can be a part of the uh, primary bot. So now let's uh, take a look at it, what I was talking about here, like how they're gonna fetch the binaries and all that. So if you look at this particular code, right, it's basically standard bash scripts that are being placed on that compromised devices, allow it to run. They can simply go, go after the you know, remote domain which is being controlled by the attacker. And what I mean by that is like, you know, attacker has a full control, they can deploy any code, change or reiterate the code as per his convenience. So you, if you just run that bash script on that system, it's gonna fetch the payloads from the remote location, and you can see that it's, can, it's gonna change the mode, make it executable, and tie it back to the architecture, whether it's a MIPS architecture and all that, and then clean it right away as well, because they don't wanna have any kind of leftover fodder there once they actually execute the code. And this was the, like the thing that we found out, you know, on the internet and all that, or you, when you try to test certain domains and all that, you get some access to certain code as well. Similarly, on this benchmark, if you look at the another code, a little bit differently, but you can look at how, the, how they actually constructed the resource, the payload, right? The payload is basically a simple iteration of the three um, alphabet characters, Q, bot, and all that. So, we talk about, we're gonna look down the lane as well, so we analyzed Mirai bot, but there was a Q bot as well with different functionalities. But you can clearly see how they're actually, you know, structuring the payloads, the naming convention, and all that. You know, make it executable, then go after, delete it right away, so that there will be no traces on the system. And idea is that you can clearly see the way they were actually going after. They want the infections, but they don't wanna have any traces on the system as well, you know, if somebody comes in and find that. If we connect the dot, these kind of things also help the advanced attackers to actually beat the kill bot feature as well, because sometimes they wanna look at certain you know, standard indicators, which might not be there, because after the execution, they have removed it. So it, it's, it's a kind of arms race, which we always used to call, right? You know, somebody has to get it done, somebody's behind, but it's an arms race at the end of the day. Let's take a look at all things. So we, we discussed about kill all functionality earlier, but they can also implement that functionality in the form of scripts as well. So you can clearly see it's a simple bash script, you know, performing certain kind of, you know, process operation, maybe scanning through the process list, performing some kind of operations to make sure that no traces are there. If they don't find any traces, go after and kill it. I want a clean system. I will reboot it. And because I have a multiple bots running it differently, and this was a part of earlier botnet, I can rescan it, reboot it, and then I can get it access to that device again. So these kind of different functionalities keep on persisting, and that's the way they are able to build botnets, and they are still able to go after building botnets every day, despite we think we have done enough in security, but exactly that's not the case. 
Anyhow, so again, another variant of the same kill all functionality. You can clearly see how the bash script is being called and all that. Uh, and they are actually on the left side going after CentOS, uh, SS, daemon, and then performing some logic to, you know, to make sure the infections are right. So the whole purpose of showing you the code during the course of this presentation is to make sure that we are just not only talking about the techniques, but exactly we have analyzed that in detail. And there are, there are standard evidences available which actually prove that these techniques are real and they are exist in the real world. Uh, so let's take a little bit deep dive into the next part. So we're gonna you know, refresh what we have uh, gone through in the last couple of slides, and then we'll delve a little bit into the real world examples, uh, try to show you that you know, the stuff exists and how bad it is. Even from the incident response point of view, whether you're doing security assessment of certain devices and all that, how these attacks di look like differently when you're analyzing at the network level or you're analyzing on the low level debug code and all that. So I want to start with, you know, we, there are certain variants came to exist like, you know, a few years back, but Mirai was the most important one, which actually sets the baseline to build more IoT bots. Um, somehow the source code got leaked earlier and the people picking that code. Again, if we connect the door, nobody wants to reinvent the wheel, just transform it in into add more code, add and write, you know, kind of deploy more C, uh, like C code, Python code and all that shell script, just enhance it and just go ahead and, and deploy it. And we'll, we'll take a look into that as well. So just to reiterate what we have gone through, I want to go through the execution flow model here. You know, the idea is to compromise the device, go ahead, fetch the malicious payload, of course, obtain system privileges by exploiting a vulnerability, performing some privilege escalation on the system, of course, launch attacks. I mean, you got comp the system got compromised, they have to launch attacks and expand the botnet. And at the end of the day, once you expand your botnet, whether you want to use it for financial gains, whether you want to use it for some different purposes, like in the underground cyber community, they can rent this botnet out to perform you know, different set of attacks, you know, trigger some phishing, different kind of things they can perform. And this is like renting a botnet as well. But we got a, we got a, like a kind of bit of easy feel that how the execution flow model works. But the next that we want to go after is some of the real world examples. Uh, there will be some screenshots, but these screenshots are taken when we perform the security assessments and uh, how we get in access to those domains. We download the malware, did some different analysis, try to get a feel of it. So different techniques were opted because if you really want to go after analyzing a malware, it's just not only a one technique that you have to go after, like whether it's a static analysis, dynamic analysis, or you have to perform some kind of you know, security assessment of the remote domains, of course, intelligence gathering, you have to perform, but it's, it's a, it, it, I always call this a multi-threading approach, right? You have to have different analytical threads that has to be there to come up with a standard, strong scenario. So let's take a look, the first one. So if you look at this uh, you know, slide here, right? So you can see that we're talking about here the, like, the variant called as a bleed street. Of course, different architectures. There's an ARM1, ARM5, you know, MIPS x86 and all that. The question is how you get used to it, you know, how you actually get an access to this particular uh, domain. There are many different ways you can go after, you know, some people these days, you know, I mean, it was a technique known earlier, they deploy honeypots as well, but they fetching, but there are other ways you can go after as, uh, you know, find these things out, you know, when you um, pen test, you know, remote CNC servers, so you got some indicators from there, you try to connect the dots, go after with different remote domains, you know, get an idea of it. But apart from that, the question is that, so you got then access to the domain which is hosting, providing a directory listing of these different binaries. And if you can see that, you know, once you run the file command and things like that, you get a feel of it, which architecture it belongs to, and it's all an executable. Because I really don't want to go too much into reverse engineering uh, during the course of this talk, so we did like basic checks and all that to actually give you a feel that, you know, those are the infected ones. So if, so if you look at the strength check, right, the one that I have not shown here is, uh, I have uh, basically highlighted in red, it's just like a hard-coded IP address in that ARM binary, right? So when that binary is going to execute in the compromised system, it's gonna go to the attacker control domain, fetch it from here, 
and then get all the malicious packages, payloads, dump on it, install it, and run on the compromised device. So while you perform analysis, you get the access to that, uh, you know, at least you come to know about that IP address, then you can start your assessment on that IP address, you know, from different sphere. Just enhancing the same scenario with the latest example, the Gephit uh, Mirai variant, it is actually an attack that is going on right now. Somehow I was doing some research last night, so we came across this thing. I don't want to show it in real time, but it is, this, this attack is right now going, in, going on. So you can see that once you get an access to it, again, the directory listing, but there are different binaries. And you can clearly see there is one called as Apache 2 as well, which is, again, a binary. But then you can see there's an infected.txt file, all infections and sort of things like that, which actually is a, contains the record of compromised IoT devices or the like, IoT devices they are going to scan. So you dump Apache 2. And then you, know, you perform analysis a little bit on strings and try to get an initial feel, kind of stuff like that. And then you do a little bit check on the background with some intelligence feed. You get a feel of that. OK, this is a you know, Gaffet um, Mirai variant. And it has an embedded the shell script. And I want to show you that as a part of the demonstration. So we're going to look at a very quick demo. It's a very basic check. Uh, we didn't we're not gonna talk about you know how we get the binaries and stuff like that. We had the binaries. We want to show that how the things are look like when those are embedded in. And just let's let's take a look at the video. So we dump the binaries from there. The three binaries we were talking about. Just try to run the file check. It's gonna give you how it's been compiled and all that. But I was like, we are damn interested in Apache too, because when the Experian attack happened earlier. Um, it was a struts vulnerability. So we would just want to check if they're building this Apache binary. Is it just a legitimate struts exploit, or is it just like kind of they're using this terminology to bypass certain scenarios? So you just simply run the strings, try to get little bit indicators. So you see that embedded C code is there. We were not interested in too much into it. What we are looking for is the embedded bash script into it. OK, we've got access. There's a firmware one. Keep on scrolling. So there we started giving him some good uh, you know, strings here, which we're going to look at, you know, ping pong, my IP, scanner, stuff like that. And now there it starts up. You can see that couple of the embedded username passwords there, and then the shell. So somehow I have not actually, I have actually let the IP address to stay there. If you want to perform some stuff down the lane, you can go ahead and do it as well. But do you want to delve into more reverse engineering where you load the stuff into IDA Pro and do the static code? But it gives you enough to believe that you know, this Apache 2 binary is a problematic one and how you really need to go, to go after and perform next set of analysis. So now we're just stacking, connecting the dots back again. We're checking the drop beer binary. It is there. We're checking WGAT. It is there, and things like that. So these are like a quick and dirty analysis. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to go a little bit more deeper into it. But at the end of the day, once you get these indicators, you try to connect them, go after the bigger sphere, and then go after you know, how, what are kind of other um, uh, compromised devices that are somewhere attached to this kind of scenario. Let's move a little bit uh, further. So in this particular screenshot, it is a, one of the audio-video conferencing devices, so like a, a kind of very big company. Uh, so we were testing certain things. We got a, somehow we got an access to their debug interface and things like that. But this actually shows that when you have to perform analysis at that level, what kind of stuff you have to go through, right? So you get a lot of these, you know, memory addresses coming in. You know, kind of modular calls are being called, functions are being you know, call and then, because any time in that device a single function is being performed, the debug logs are throwing a lot of uh, garbage stuff into it, but you have to actually extract the ones that you want. In this particular screenshot, I have a demo as well to uh, prove this artifact. This actually shows that whenever something is happening on that device, there is a, some WKID calls are being issued, the shell scripts are being run, and at the back end, it's fetching something kind of bad things, like a bad payloads and it's getting installed and things like that. 
So you extract, somehow you are able to extract the payload. You can still run it by third party service, try to get a feel of it, whether it's a known one or is the, the variant of the already existing one. So you get a feel of it like uh, this is still a malicious one. The shell scripts, the kind of payloads they are fetching are malicious. So we found different variants of Mirai as well, but these variants, like we're targeting a very well-known audio-video conferencing systems. Let's take a look. So if you look at this particular screenshot, right, we're talking about the Anarchy bot here. From the top, if you look, there are like three commands that are being actually issued, right? Um, started from the session is registered, and they actually go, gonna go after, you know, default, enable, system. And these are some of the commands they run in an iterative way, hierarchical way to get, to perform some kind of privilege escalation or to get a control of certain set of binaries by calling these commands. And then they actually go into shell mode with the SS command, and then their inherent code starts um, triggering up the scenario. So if you look at the bin busy box one, again, the open source package, it is calling the anarchy payload here. And they're gonna perform some different kind of things. And if we really look back with that topic we discussed, no need to reinvent the wheel. So they still use the Mirai code, but the variant is a little bit different. The standards are the same, but they're performing different set of functionalities. Let's take a look at the another variant. This one is a cult bot, right? Similar scenario. Similar things found on some another deployment of the, uh, the compromised audio video conferencing system that was uh, you know, available on the internet. In this particular uh, scenario or variant, they, they treat it as a cult one. But whole scenario, going into the mode, enabling system shell, is the same as Mirai. Let's go into another variant, the Sora bot. Uh, again, the scenario is the same but the payload is a little bit different. So they might want to perform certain kind of different activities which are not in line with the Mirai one. And we just came to know, like, you know, the person who drafted this code, I think it's in the media. I think the guy has been, you know, somebody's been prosecuted one or the other way uh, by the legal authorities, been custody. But the caution here is that source code is there. I don't need to reinvent it. And they are not doing it exactly. Now we are extending it to, it to the next level, and what we're gonna talk about right now is the brute force scenario. So there was a compromised device. It triggered up different kind of variants. Now what exactly it is supposed to do? It is supposed to launch brute force attacks. And if you can clearly see, again, there's a lot of debug logs. How will you figure it out when you're doing research? Because sometimes you are not on the same network. Sometimes you might be on the same network. But when you access to these kind of uh, debug interfaces and all that, how you'll figure it out? So you have to find indicators. You have to look for the artifacts. And when we're doing the research, looking into it, and you can clearly see which module, which is called as an um, AVC. It's a video controller, audio video thingy. And they have certain kind of functions embedded in, and they have like a telnet function in itself as well. They call that function. Once I've actually, so if you look at the top, they just got a telnet underscore client. They register the telnet session and they start reiterating with the embedded username or password and start initiating telnet connections or brute force attack or password cracking attempt from that compromised system. And it will keep on going on for a long period of time. And so, but when you are analyzing as a part of researcher, you are analyzing into it, trying to figure it out, how will you come to know that these things are there? Again, it's a multi-threading, like we used to have multi-threading environment, but even with the analysis, you have to look into bigger sphere. You just cannot beat the bush with just few artifacts. But this is a reality. Eventually, when we do a little background research, when it's done, it was using the root and the ANCO password, right? You do bacon, and you find that the ANCO password was like some kind of uh, used for some Unix system so it means they, they know, they build this, uh, this uh, list by looking at some of the default systems that are available on the internet. They're gonna go after Unix system and all that. So you keep on connecting the things, analysis will start giving you different scenarios, and then from there onwards you can you know, launch your analysis to the next level. It doesn't make sense if we don't see the video in real time. Uh, I won't say real time, but I have embedded video in, try to give you a feel. 
how it looks like when you're performing analysis. And let's just take a look at it. So I have to, you know, I just remove certain artifacts from here, but it actually gives you a good view. It's a three minutes video, but this is how it looks like when you get an access to the interface, how fast the attack is moving, and things like that. So there's a lot of other things that are happening in that compromised device, but you can clearly see those uh, um, basically indicators start popping up, right? This one is showing some kind of Miori variant. Okay, that's fine. We are seeing, seeing that, okay, the compromised device is performing certain kind of activity without any interaction. Let's just take, just keep on going on. Now, if you look at right now, I will highlight it in a few seconds here. So there, so it creates a telnet session because the telnet is redirecting to the pseudo terminal. It created a telnet session and it start launching the brute force attack or password cracking attempts. It is going from the real time system. We are just sitting back. We are analyzing the system, looking into it. And you can clearly see it's keep on triggering the attack. Again, there is a sport login and all that. And the telnet sessions are keep on getting created. Next set of uh, username password is being tried. It sleeps for a few minutes, trigger it again, and things like that. But this is all a, a kind of compromised audio video conferencing system. No interaction, nothing is just going on the fly as soon as it connects back to the internet, and it is going after. Yeah. So it halted because the sleep function triggered in. Now it's picking up again. So you can imagine, this is just a one compromise system. You can imagine if you have thousands of these compromised systems that they're going after the similar scenario, that's how they actually build bigger botnets because it's just going in a distributed fashion. They have the IP list where they want to create a talent. They want to check the uh, you know, baseline there, whether they have weak security configuration or not. So somehow it started showing the traces of Mirai as well. Yeah. So this is an attack they want to actually show in real time that actually these kind of things exist, but when you have to perform analysis, you have to look into various scenarios. So, so we, we started with the, you know, why IoT, how, what IoT, you know, how it looks like. We went through the, uh, you know, taxonomy, the botnet execution flow model. We went through different techniques by looking at the source code disclosures. Then we look into the real world examples gone through two, one of the basic video demonstration of Apache 2, how vulnerable that binary was, looked into one of the audio video conferencing system. But then when you still have to perform empirical analysis, you still have to go and pick a few samples. All the techniques that we have gone through, we have to map those techniques back to the different IoT botnets because we wanna get a bigger picture, a bigger matrix, try to see how the evolve the bots are evolving with the passage of time. And we did conduct one study, which we call as empirical analysis. We tried to pick up the, you know, the bots that were like the first ones that came to exist that actually got a bigger attention. We went to like Hajime, Persirai, Amnesia, Bricker One, Mirai, Linux, IRC, Hydra, and all that. But again, the caution, the part that we want to obtained from this research is we have a techniques, we wanna look into CNC architecture, communication protocol, you know, infection strategies, persistence, denial of service capabilities, different kind of features, and how it maps back to the different set of bots, right? Then it actually gives you a view, and when you're building algorithms for detecting these kind of scenarios, you need this kind of intelligence. It starts from your simple analysis, pen testing certain domain, get some artifacts, testing some real world scenarios, and then actually building this kind of uh, research layout at the end of the day to get a solid intelligence that can be feeded back to your automated detection and prevention solutions. It makes sense because let's say if you want to write a signature, it's just an old technique of drafting signature, but you still know, you know, what this particular one of the variant, okay, that technique is not gonna be good at the network level. Sort of things like that. And some of the things which other researchers have worked on, 
the simple IoT botnet signatures you can clearly see. They pick it from. Is it just uh, some of the Yara rules and all that? You know, get the strings, put it in. You know, get through the binary, check whether this not there or not. But the question again that we, all, as our researchers, we need to ask is, you know, keep on sharing with the community at the end of the day. But then, on the contrary, it's just not only a one thing that you have to go after. It's just not only that, okay, you find a one compromise system, you perform the analysis, you share with the community. We need a bigger picture as well. We need to build security solutions so the intelligence need to be fielded in that way. We talk about data mining, machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, but again, at the end of the day, you have to mine data. And for data, you have to have sampling performed on a bigger sets to make sure that whatever you've been concluding out of it is good. So that being said, we started with the Internet of Things. We came back to the same scenario here. The one thing that I want to highlight with the Internet of Things scenario is that I think maybe we have many companies out there that talk about IoT security and all that. I think the bigger part that we are missing is the taxonomy, right? When we talk about IoT, is it IT plus OT? Is it information technology or operational technology? Is it Internet of Things? What, what is it all about? So we have to take it out of the marketing scenarios. They, okay, I know in cybersecurity world, after two, three years, you need to come up with different marketing terminology, but we need a very dedicated set of Internet of Things taxonomy. You're categorizing into enterprise IoT. You're categorizing into end, end user um, uh, scenario where they use the IoT devices. So some of the things are there, because if you really want to nurture and build strong security solution, taxonomy is very much desired. You cannot just put up a one standard solution and let it run for things where we come up, okay, there is a router, it is an IoT. All you are running is a white listing on the top of it. So that's how you can't defeat the way botnets are being deployed and designed. So that being said, we still have three minutes. Questions? So it, again, it, uh, it depends on the, so I want to repeat your question again so that everybody knows about it. So I think he's asking, have we seen any kind of advanced botnets where they actually go after, when we talk about payloads, they go after rootkits deployed in which are undetected in nature, right? So I think I will start it in the context of uh, when we perform experimental analysis, right? So the idea is that, you know, we look at the volumes of attacks, right? We can still say that in this world that antivirus is dead, but still at the end of the day, malware keep on coming and things like that. The, the traces that we have seen, looking at the architecture, because the Nix-based architecture and all that, most of the, that thing that is a little bit derived towards the volume level, right? So the volume that we are seeing with that kind of Mirai variant and all that is the techniques. But on the contrary, the question is how many security solutions are being deployed to detect the risk in these kind of devices? Like routers, who check? You know, you have exposed and things like that and at the end of the day, right? I'm not in, uh, like uh, totally negating the fact that there will not be those kind of rootkits, but the volume is not that high. So when we derive analysis, build solutions, we'll go after where you can detect something on the fly rather than just waiting for those scenarios. And Linux rootkits, we have like, you know, tools like earlier Rootkit Hunter and all that, you know, OSAC hits and all that, which are behavioral file integrity monitoring and all that. But again, at the end of the day, it will eventually come and the volume will increase as soon as the advanced security solutions come to play. Because if we don't have advanced security solutions, they are getting the work done with the same period of, like, same set of code, and why they really need to go after building advanced Rootkit code and all that. But there will be some samples down there which are undetected will be running in the wild. That's what we really need to find it out. Hope I've answered the question. No, 
not even. exactly. So if I'm getting your question right, it's like if we have like additional set of packages installed, like GCC and all that, which it, which might make it difficult for the malware authors to deploy the code. Yeah, yeah. So no, exactly. These are the couple of uh, open source packages that we discussed here, but eventually. The one thing that we have analyzed during the course of this research is that they are already also utilizing those binaries as well for their own purposes, right? That's why if you look at the, some of the pre-compiled binaries and all that, it's not necessary they're always using wget or FTP and TFTP and all that. They are using like these kind of standard curl binaries as well because the question there is they want that thing package to be available on the compromised device and it can still use to fetch the payloads on the fly. So those are the things that are there. I don't see the question again boils down to the one part. All these devices, how many security solutions are placed to prevent infections in audio video conferencing systems? That's the question that we really need. These kind of IoT devices are not enough. All they're relying is on a signature based whitelisting and all that. You know, if it hits on a malicious IP, stop it. But I think this, this, this problem is going way beyond that right now. I mean, I'll be around if you have any more questions. Thanks, everyone, for attending this talk. I appreciate that.